Our next uh, presenter uh, is really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Rio Hirose, uh, who is a senior liver transplant surgeon at UCSF, who's really a national leader in trying to shape the current organ allocation policies. And uh, uh, he had served as the chair of the liver intestinal, uh, liver intestinal transplant subcommittee for UNOS and really instrumental in implementing some of the recent changes. And uh, he's continuing to put up the fight against the inequities in organ allocation. So I don't think there's anybody who is uh, more qualified to talk about uh, the, the new HCC organ allocation system. And you forgot your uh, bulletproof vest today for this. <laughs> Again, I hate to contradict the last two speakers, but the future of transplantation is allocation and HCC. So um, I have to say, Chris, uh, I agree. I salivate when I see the thin abdominal wall and lots of ascites, but any surgeon can tackle that. They can go to Florida or, or wherever, you know, New Orleans. Um, you know, it takes a real surgeon to actually go through that 10 inches of fat, so. Um, in any event, I wanted to talk to you about uh, two of my favorite subjects, uh, liver cancer and liver allocation. I've been spending about a decade of my life uh, trying to fix things for all patients in this country, but particularly for patients in the West Coast in California. Um, as you all know, HCC has become an uh, indication for transplant beginning in 1996. Um, I'm only going to have one quiz question for the group. So Mazzafaro uh, published his data in 1996 in the New England Journal, uh, came up with his criteria for uh, folks with HTC that do well after transplant, and those are patients with a single lesion less than five or two to three lesions all less than three. So this is your quiz question. Um, Mazzafaro's landmark New England Journal study, A, described a single center experience, B, was a series of only 48 patients comparing 33 patients meeting Milan criteria versus 15 patients beyond. C is the most quoted cited article in transportation, and D, all of the above. D, all of the above. So I tell the residents, uh, don't, don't um, poo poo your single center experience of 48 patients. You may end up having the most quoted article in the history of transplantation. So, um, so what, uh, just briefly, everyone knows this. If you meet the uh, Milan criteria, look at that five year survival. Pretty remarkable. And even these guys that actually didn't meet criteria, look at their five-year the five survival, 60%, not terrible. So that means that we're leaving out some people that we can probably save if you just limit yourself to Milan criteria. Now, with all due respect to HCV and fatty liver disease and alcohol, um, what is the fastest growing indication for liver transplant? It's clearly HCC. Um, we have an aging population. We still have the effects of patients who may have been treated but still have HCV cirrhosis, have NASH and NAFL, those patients all get cancer. HCC now accounts for more than 30% of the liver transplants in the United States, clearly the most common indication now. Now, how, how has that evolved over time? So it's less than 5% of all transplants before the MELD score was inst uh, instituted in 2002. And that's compared to, in 2002 to 2008, 10 to 15% of transplants were done for HCC. So if that's the case, we really should think about maximizing transplant benefits for all patients with HCC. That is, triage, definitely the most urgent candidate first, meaning those patients that don't need a transplant right now, we shouldn't transplant them right now. And then we gotta maximize post-transplant survival, keep on trying to not have patients recur post-transplant. And this is the curves that tell you in terms of both listing and in terms of the transplants that are done. And if you can uh, see that um, HCV due to uh, folks like your, you guys, the hepatologists and Nora, everybody, so HCV is going down in terms of um, indication. But look, look what is uh, going up. Now, it is true that alcohol and NASH are going up, but HCC is going up further. Okay. So how do you prioritize patients with HCC? Because these patients, just like others with metabolic disease and other things, their need for transplant or their indication for transplant is not reflected by their MELD score. So we developed, or we, the community developed, exception system that developed with implementation MELD to allocate extra MELD points to these patients so they would have access to a transplant. So first, T1 lesions, single lesion less than two, are not given any HCC exception points. Why? Because when they were transplanted with a single lesion less than two, a third of them had, with an arterial enhancing lesion less than two, had no tumor ex ex at explant. So we were making a diagnosis that was wrong. 
And this actually continues even to this day somewhat. There are still some patients that don't have HCC on their explant that's never had local regional therapy that don't have um, a tumor in the explant. We want to not transplant those. Since 2004, patients meeting Milan criteria, but not as low as T1, have been granted automatic HTC exception points. Again, what are those criteria? Single lesion uh, less than five or two to three, um, none of which are greater than three. So what was the evolution? Well, first we gave them 29 points off the, uh, off the bat. We, we quickly found out that's way too many points in terms of their drop off and their access to transplant. So th then a few years later, they were dropped down to 24. And a few years later, they were dropped down to 22. And we still thought, and, and we, I'll show you why we thought this, with this automatic increase every three months, and that's, uh, I'm gonna term that the MELD escalator, the patients with HCC still had too much access to transplant, at least compared to the non-HCC patients, based on both transplant rate and mortality. So uh, Ken Washburn showed us this, and I have to show you the UNOS map to see, to show you that actually, depending on the region, this, that, those statements are true or really true. This is where we are in region five. Try to remember that number. We're in region five, um, and that's the number I want you to remember. One and nine are also very high meld areas. Um, there are other parts of the country, like three and 11, and other places, six, that have a much lower meld score transplant. So this is, the, the country's divided into 11 UNOS regions. We're in region five. So if you look at the percentage of uh, dropout patients comparing HCC and non-HCC patients, um, uh, according to uh, Washburn's paper, uh, you can see that if you compare the HCC patients versus the non-HCC patients, that the percentage of dropout for the HCC patients in general across the country was lower than the non-HCC patients, except for one place right here, this is us. So we're pretty even already um, compared to the entire rest of the country that our HCC patients, in general, the HCC patients were being overprioritized. Maybe not in our region where they have to wait so long. What about percentage of transplants and um, within 12 months? Now, e even us for sure here, if you use percentage of transplants within 12 months or their access to a transplant, you can see how the HTC patients had a higher access to transplant across the board, uh, wherever you are in the United States. Okay, and you can look at the percentage across the United States too and see how different region three is down south where Florida and Oxford Clinic live versus us in region five in terms of your chance of getting a transplant within 12 months. This is, this is a geographic inequity that I've been trying to um, deal with or our committee has been trying to deal with over the last decade. What about more recently? And uh, Neil Mehta is our uh, uh, superstar who really uh, with Francis has revolutionized a lot of things in transplant. I'm the, I'm the guy that takes those ideas and tries to get them into national policy. But in any event, he looked at the, the, what's been going on more recently in terms of short weight regions and long weight regions. And you can see in 2010, 90% of transplants in the short weight regions received a liver transplant within three months of listing. Whereas in long weight regions, and these are HCC patients, 20 to 30% of patients received a liver transplant within three months of waiting. So uh, long weight regions, this is New England, this is uh, West Coast, and this is New York. And these uh, three and 11 are the South and Southeast, and 10 is the Midwest. Okay, so what has happened to the differences in terms of different eras, 2005 to 2009, versus the second era, 2010 to 2014? You can see that everything's gone up a little bit, even in the short uh, weight regions versus medium weight regions versus long. But you can see how much more they've gone up in our regions, lo uh, long weight regions. So. If you look at the cumulative prop, uh, probability dropout in within three years, this is the difference between this era and this one. So they've gone up 24% cumulative probability dropout, increasing medium time to transplant, gone up six months as opposed to the short weight regions, only gone up a month. And the increased risk of dropout, the hazard ratio of one era versus another, you can see that our patients in our long weight regions have a higher risk of dropout. Okay. so. We've talked about the fact that in many areas of the country that the HCC patients enjoyed a higher access to transplant. So what have we done about it as uh, on the committee? So one simple thing was to actually institute a uh, delay in which you don't get your meld points right away. You wait six months. And what does that matter? Because our patients always waited at least six months. Those parts in the other country did not. They got their transplants right away when they got their MELD score. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, 
we modeled what would happen if we use, the, here's the current policy in terms of transplant rate, HCC versus non-HCC. And we looked at modeling in terms of LSAM, that's a SRTR, uh, liver transplant simulation model, that looked at what that would do with, the, uh, what a three month delay would do, what a six month delay and nine month delay. So you can see with a six month delay of granting the um, exception points that now the transplant rates might narrow. And similarly, when we looked at um, where those uh, match meld versus um, uh, HCC uh, versus non-HCC, you can see that the difference is, uh, is greatest in the lower HCC, uh, lower meld uh, points. This is an example of what happens with a six and eight month delay, that the difference, this is a difference gap between the HCC and non-HCC transplant rates with a six or nine month delay really evens out at around zero. So that's, those, are the evident, uh, those are the data that we used to really uh, invoke our national policy. So what did we do? We did two things, we capped and delayed. So the delay was a six month um, uh, waiting period for every transplant patient with HCC to get their exception scores. And we also capped the exception scores at 34. And why did we do that? Because uh, we also at the same time uh, put a new policy in place called SHARE 35, where the patients with a MELD score of 35 had regional sharing, just like the status 1As had, to get them higher access to transplant. So status 1As, the acute fulminant failures, those are the sickest patients, they had access to a transplant by regional sharing. So any liver donor in that region were to go to the status 1As first. But then uh, there was a fair amount of data that showed pretty convincingly the, MELD, the chronic liver failure patients with a MELD greater than 35 also had that same mortality, if not higher, especially if they stayed on the wait list longer than the 1A. So that was the reasoning behind going to SHARE 35, which was another uh, allocation policy that was changed. So in the past, I said HTC um, allocation policy did over prioritize HTC patients over non HTC patients. So we did this thing. We, we again kept on dropping the number of patients, instituted a six month delay. And what does that six month delay do? It not only gets prevents patients from being transplanted immediately for HTC, which actually helps with post transplant outcomes. It's been shown that if you don't wait at all and just transplant them, the post-transplant outcomes are worse. And why is that? Because no biological test of time is actually given. So those patients aren't allowed to have this Darwinian thing. It seems cruel, but the, but the test of time is actually a good way to sort out those folks that will recur uh, after a transplant. And actually, it actually allows not only the test of time, but assessment of response to treatment. Over 95% of patients that have HTC in this country are now treated with local regional therapy. One of the other biological tests that is actually a good prognostic indicator in terms of how well you do after transplant is in fact the response to treatment. So those two things actually help select out, at least select out and not transplant them, the, poor, the people that do poorly after transplant. So, um, you know, when you stand on the shoulders of giants like Francis and others, um, we actually did push Milan criteria. So when, when we showed you that the Milan criteria folks did really well, but those outside of Milan criteria, there are some of those folks that are beyond Milan criteria who do well. Uh, we came up with, um, as a group, what we call the downstaging criteria, UCSF downstaging criteria. So to meet those, you have to have uh, meet uh, these sort of mildly or modestly expanded criteria. But here you capture patients that wouldn't have otherwise qualified for transplant, but we were able to downstage them to within Milan. So those UCSF staging uh, downstaging criteria, including patients with a single lesion, less than eight, but if you have two or three lesions, each of them have to be less than five with the sum of the maximal diameter being eight, or in fact, if you even have four or five lesions, none of them can be greater than three, and again, the sum of the diameters have to be less than uh, equal to eight with no vascular invasion based on imaging. If you fit the, these criteria and you are successfully downstaged to within, within Milan, the, the uh, survival is essentially the same, and so you can outstanding results if they remain in Milan. Certainly there are people who drop out, that start out within downstaging criteria, but again, the response to treatment and the maintain, maintenance of these folks within Milan are good enough criteria to now have more patients that can fit uh, a little bit expanded criteria who were formerly excluded from transplant, left to die, now we're saving them. What does that do? Now we have more patients with HCC that need a transplant. That's not really what we need, but at least we're expanding uh, the criteria to actually not discriminate against folks that have um, just fall just outside of um, Milan criteria. Uh, 
So what have we done? Actually, now they're somehow part of UNO's uh, national organ allocation policy. So this is a standard now. So UCSF criteria have been accepted and have been implemented. So those now uh, patients who start within UCSF downstage criteria, downstage within T2 Milan, when reprogram goes into place, that's an automatic exception. You don't have to go through the regional review board. It'll all go through automatically. So it's being implemented now. Again, I'm not gonna go through what the standard exception. Again, if you fit UCSF criteria and you stay within T2, then you can get an automatic. If you start beyond UCSF criteria, you can still um, uh, apply to the new National Review Board and be reviewed by the HCC subcommittee. And again, um, something that we've already done and we've published on, there's not gonna be any exception for those patients with an AFP greater than 1,000 unless they respond and their AFP goes down to 500, also national policy. So what are we gonna do with exceptions starting in early 2019? So we're gonna get rid of all these regional review boards, all 11 of them, because there was a huge amount of inconsistency throughout the uh, 11 regions. There are regions that were routinely um, have exceptions accepted for encephalopathy, for ascites, for tumors that are 20 centimeters. Uh, there are, so these are all different things, 11 different regions, 11 different criteria. So we're gonna eliminate all that and we're gonna make a national review board. Every single transplant center is gonna be able to, if they want, designate a uh, representative to the NLRB. We have a lot of education to do. We have a lot of folks that you know, need to actually look at our guidance documents and make sure they understand how they're judging. I'm, I'm gonna be the inaugural chair of the NLRB, but there'll be three of them. One's pediatrics, one's gonna focus on HCC, and the other is all other exceptions. The interesting thing, though, is that we're not gonna give the same score across the country. So right now, no matter where you are, whether it's Louisiana, Mayo Clinic, Jacksonville, Indiana, where they meld transplant you know, patients at 22 off the golf course, versus us, we all, we all are not gonna get the same score. In fact, what score you will get is based on your median MELD score around your area. So the score you will be given is a median MELD score transplant around your area, your transplant center, minus three points. Why minus three? Um, that's actually where many of our HCC exception patients are transplanted. Exception patients in general are uh, transplanted at a lower MELD score, median MELD score, than the lab MELD patients, and that's for many reasons. The um, HCC patients are very stable. They maintain that score for months on end. Whereas our, whether our sickest patients actually either go higher and die or go higher and get a transplant. So throughout the country, almost in every single DSA, the exception patients are transplanted at a medium mild score that's less than uh, three, sometimes more than five points below um, the medium mild to transplant for their area. So again, so currently all patients in the country receive a MELD of 28 after a six month delay. Because of differences in the medium MELD score of transplant, this means different access to transplant for HCC patients in different areas of the country. And so again, in some areas of the country, HTC patients get, wait, their trans, wait their six months, get their 28, and immediately within days to a month, they'll get their transplant. Some, like in our area, they get their 28 and that does them nothing. Um, they just hang out for the next 18 months, maybe even longer. And again, reminder that all exceptions are capped at 34. So what's the uh, magnitude of the current disparity right now? If you look at median MELD of transplant as one metric of the differences of transplant, you can see how that actually varies a fair amount. So in region 10, it's 25. In region 11, it's 28. And in our region, it's 32. If you look at DSAs of specific centers, the, the um, differences are even more staggering. But in looking at MELD, Bands. Let's look, look at a MELD of 30 to 34 if they get listed at our center or at CPNC or Stanford, or for that matter, anywhere in Region 5. You can see after 30 days, that patient, 84% uh, of them will still be waiting, as, and 12% of them will have gotten a transplant in Region 5. Region 3, which again, again includes um, Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, Louisiana, Alabama, the Southeast, 55% of them will already have gotten a deceased donor transplant within 30 days if you have mailed 30 to 34. And 32% um, and will still be waiting. If you look at certain DSAs, you can see that in California, in fact, LA uh, is even worse than uh, San Francisco in terms of their medium mail to transplant, as opposed to some of these area, uh, other areas of the country in Mississippi, in certain areas of Texas. <clears throat> 
Okay. So under the new LR NLRB, how many points will the exception patients get? I, again, I said it's the median meld minus three for a 250-mile circle around the transplant center. Now, why do we do that? Originally, we had written it that the median meld score minus three for their DSA is going to be how it was um, pegged. But the secretary of HHS and the HRSA administrators had get rid of the word DSA and region for every single allocation policy. They said that the region and the DSA is not a reasonable unit of looking at distribution. So we got rid of region DSA and looked at what would be a re reasonable area to look at. And we decided that around every single transplant center, we draw a 250 mile circle. And in that circle would be transplant centers, and the median meld score transplant for those transplant centers is where your median meld will be pegged. HAT patients will still be given 40, oxalosis patients will be given more than MMAT, and the, each area will be assessed every six months to adjust up and down what the median meld score transplant is. So this is just a bar graph that shows what that median meld of transplant for a 250 mi nan, uh, nautical mile radius for every single liver transplant center in the country. So if you look at region one, two, three, four, five, you can see these are the centers with the highest medium meld of transplant. This is us, and this is Southern California. Um, so the medium meld minus three will be much higher for us than for other regions in the country. Okay. So again, um, as a separate thing, the, the entire allocation policy may undergo a sea change on December 4th. Um, as I said, the Secretary of HHS and HRSA told us, the UNOS uh, committees, that we must eliminate DSA and UNOS regions as units of distribution. These are units of distribution that were accidentally gerrymandered. In other words, they were created about 30 years ago, never designed to actually be used in distribution, and that's what we've been using for three decades, for no good reason. The problem with those 58 DSAs and the 11 regions is that they physically separate areas with high supply, low demand, with low supply and high demand. So you create this disparity with exactly the borders that have been drawn. Uh, they're born, they're totally drawn crazily by a drunk guy on his napkin. If you look at some of the, some of the DSA areas, like in Texas, you, you can't explain how, you know, one dot here and this one over here is one DSA. But uh, in any event, uh, we've been told that it's illegal and doesn't make sense, and uh, that's all true. So we're still right now, even to this late date, negotiating how big the circles are and who would be included in those circles. We had a final in-person meeting of the UNOS Literary Committee, made a recommendation that I didn't love, but we're still jockeying for how that uh, system works. If you really want to hear about what the details are, I'm happy to share them at the end. But we fair um, here in Region 5 favor broader sharing. What does broader sharing mean? It does mean increasing uh, uh, distribution, which means increasing transport, potentially increasing co cost of transplant. But what's not mentioned a lot is the decreasing cost to the entire healthcare system by reducing care of the very sick patients in the ICU waiting transplant. If you save a week of ICU stay, that far exceeds the cost increase in transplant from transportation. And analysis have shown that increasing broader distribution saves the entire medical system a lot more than what it's, uh, what it's gonna increase. Um, so finally, you know, who should, be, uh, should we considering uh, to have liver transplants for HTC? So in general, it's pretty easy. You know, don't transplant those patients that don't need a transplant right now, those that can wait, and do tr don't, don't transplant those who will clearly do poorly after a transplant either, that is, have a high, uh, incident, uh, high risk of recurrence. So that's the sort of Goldilocks principle. Um, Transplant them, the, one, the ones that need a transplant, that are advanced enough, to, they'll likely to progress or drop out and die of HCC. But at the same time, don't push that envelope too much uh, because you'll uh, do patients that will do poorly and will recur. So some obvious examples of who not to transplant, those patients that actually don't have HCC, that's still happening in Region 3 and Region 11 a little bit in terms of folks that actually get a transplant, never had a local regional therapy, and don't have any HCC on their explant. Small percentage. A couple hundred a year, though. Those patients with extra hepatic metastases, of course we don't do that willingly, but sometimes we probably do unknowingly because these metastases are hard to pick up. The, one of the problems with the UNOS policy right now is that we actually group together all these HCC patients with different prognoses and risk for out output. So right now, today, we still lump together all the HCC patients, meeting two teach criteria and patients that are downstage, and give them all the same level of priority. 
that really is a heterogeneous group of patients, some with a really high risk for dropout, some with a really low risk for dropout, which I would argue should get either no priority or much less priority than they're getting right now. And again, Neil, our superstar, figured out which of those patients are that uh, don't need priority. If you look at the T2 patients, the T2 tumor patients that are heterogeneous, and uh, evaluated the ones that we had T2 lesions to determine risk factors for weightless dropout, you can identify the high-risk patients, the ones with bigger lesions if they're single and they have more, and lack of a complete response to local regional therapy, again, another marker of whether you're gonna do well, and a persistently high AFP after local regional therapy. But, but on the converse side of it, um, identifying the low dropout rates, that, and these patients represent a good 20% of the patients that we actually do with HCC, single tumor, less than three centimeters, totally complete response to local renal therapy, and a low, very low AFP after the first local regional therapy, these guys drop out at one and two years at 1.3 and 1.6% at one year and two years respectively. Compared to the rest of the group, just put in graphically, here's that low risk group and here's the high risk group. Should we do, be doing these guys, right? Of course, it's a sweet transplant. It's like the easiest thing on earth. Again, anyone in Florida or New Orleans can do those transplants. <laughs> um, but, it, uh, but then we tried to push this through and uh, see, um, is this generalizable outside our region? Because this is a single center, single region study. So then um, Dr. Mehta repeated the analysis in a national analysis using UNOS data and did find another uh, um, cohort that was less. Now they actually, the UNOS data unfortunately doesn't really uh, ha capture response to therapy. But in any event, the entire cohort had an 18.3% dropout at one year, 27% at two years, and there was a low risk group. Single lesion, again, less than three, low AFP, and child's class A, and with a mel less than sodium. So that dropout was much less, much less than the rest of the uh, cohort. So again, we can make national policy to either give patients that fit these low risks for dropout much fewer points or even no exception points until they either recur or have, um, have a indicator like a patient that has resected, they have to recur before they can get trans, uh, uh, any transplant exception points. I would propose that we do the same for these low risk dropout patients. That would get rid of 20% of the patients that are um, being listed for transplant right now. All right, so I would, uh, you know, they say that organ allocation is just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I disagree. Um, on the Titanic, there were a bunch of lifeboats that went out not completely full and there was inequitable saving of lives. Uh, if you're a first class passenger, you had a much higher rate of survival than a third class passenger. It's not rearranging the deck chairs, it's figuring out who's gonna get the, on the lifeboats and making sure those lifeboats are full. And so how do you do that when you have a lot of patients that need a transplant? Well, if you think about the lifeboats, you wanna save the most lives, I think. And so who needs the lifeboat first? Is it the Olympic swimmer that can wait till the lifeboat comes back or is it the sort of child or maybe the older person that can't swim very well and you should give those guys the first uh, seats on the lifeboat. So in other words, we have decided as a group to do sickest first. So the most urgent are the status 1As and the MELD greater than 35 and then less, or very urgent still are these guys that have a significant mortality at 30 days. But then somewhere in there you should intercalate the HCC patients. They are less likely um, to die on the list sometimes, and we want to pick the ones that have um, a lower risk of recurrence. And then you have to think about where you're going to fit the patients that have um, uh, really bad quality of life, and that's never been actually inserted there because of the mortality of everyone above them. All right, so are there patients that we're rescuing too early? Yes, clearly they are. I, I think I pointed out some of those groups. Uh, those are the patients that can wait. Um, and uh, we need to divert the lifeboats to those who are drowning more quickly. Uh, possible changes, again, I would actually absolutely require an attempt at local, reg local regional therapy before any exception points are granted. If you can't perform it, you need an explanation why there's contraindicated. I would certainly give lower priority to HCC patients with a very low risk of dropout. And as HCC scorings and risk stratifications evolve, prioritize the patient with the best, most post-transplant benefit. Those that are gonna fall off, but those aren't, that aren't gonna uh, recur. And in the meanwhile, before, until we have that, we do have AFP, biological test of time, and response to therapy as powerful predictors.
One last thing we've been working with, I've been working with a bunch of MIT guys. Uh, they're a bunch of mathematic geeks, and they're really cool because they like to do machine learning stuff. And uh, we've actually developed with them, um, Parsi and I, Parsi, a former fellow, with this thing called an optimized prediction or mortality to hopefully replace the MELD and the MELD exception uh, scores. Uh, this is a machine learning algorithm that looks at the entire data set of UNOS and comes up using a methodology called optimized classification trees to, pr to better predict three-month mortality and integrates HCC patients in, in with the non-HCC patients and uses, in addition to 25 other variables, number, size, and AFP levels from the HCC candidates. And just a simple way of to, uh, explaining optimized classification trees, there's nodes and leaves, and every node you actually separate out two, sep two separations of patients with higher or lower survival. And you can do this, you know, 10 levels, so you get two to the 10th different kinds of patients. And you can uh, much more accurately figure out who's going to be using machine learning and what those levels are uh, to figure out who's going to die quicker at 30 days. And uh, if you look at some of the variables we use, we use a lot of the things that we already collect, including things like bilirubin creatinine INR, sodium, dialysis the first year, changes in MEL, changes in all these things, um, as well as AFP numbers of tumors, et cetera. And so if you use this machine learning to create a sort of new MELD score, what, what does that get you? It actually, your AUC, uh, by the way, MELD score actually in the high MELD uh, scores, the AUC, the C statistics is actually is not that great. But this other score that we've been working with um, does a lot better and saves at least 500 lives a year on the wait list if, you were to, if we were to switch from MELD sodium to what we were calling the optimized um, mortality uh, uh, algorithm. So in summary, HCC is certainly an increased indication for transplant. We still have to yet to really help to identify the HCC patients that will benefit most. Allocation policy to prioritize HCC patients is still an evolution. We still need to stratify, stratify these patients, and we have newer methods to potentially do that. So stay tuned. And I just wanted to end with the final rule that uh, reminds us what allocation policy should uh, be based on. This is a final rule published by the HHS in 2000 that governs or organ allocation policies. They shall be based on sound medical judgment. They shall seek to achieve the best use of donated organs, designed to waste, uh, avoid wasting organs, avoid futile transplants, promote patient access, and shall not be based on the candidate place of residence or listing. We haven't really complied with that in the last 20 years. We're hoping to get close to that in December. Uh, and finally, um, distributing organs as broad a geographic area feasible in order of decreasing me medical urgency. We do this, we don't do this, and hopefully we will soon. So stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rio. So uh, to clarify, with the median minus three, this would happen still after six, six months, months of uh, wait. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> so with the disparity in the median male score across previously called regions, there's really no advantage for somebody here to move to go and get There'll a transplant? There'll be much less advantage to go to somewhere else to get a transplant for HCC. Yep. Yeah. Mary Pat. There's no escalator. They just stay there. They just stay there? Yep. And if you want to have a patient go above that, you have to appeal to the National Review Board for HCC and explain why that patient should go up. <clears throat> Rock. Are you willing to spitball and give us a, a sense of how long you think the patients can be survived in that way? Uh, the HCC patients? Yeah. Um, well, if you look at the current environment, our patients get transplanted at a median meld minus three or four or even five. So. I don't think it's going to be any longer for our patients. We'll see what happens. The, right now, they're getting transplanted at that, at that level, medium mild minus three. Yeah, that, that has gone up with time, and I can't. So we have to balance that with what's going to happen with the entire organ allocation system, where it will be a wider um, sharing uh, distribution network. So that time may actually go down in our region. We'll have to wait and see the effects of um, a much more contentious part, which is changing all of organ allocation to large circles. Um, half the country doesn't love that. Last question. <clears throat> Varun. Uh, the two to three centimeter lesion uh, policy that's up for public comment right now, 
Um, is that still out there? And what kind of response are you guys getting in the public comment? I'm sorry, which? Uh, um, the one that I think it's, if I read it correctly, uh, lesions that are single lesions, two to three centimeters in size, need to have some local regional therapy first or some recurrence. Yeah, before so that actually, when we put that out for public comment before, people didn't love um, the proposal because they said, well, how are you going to define recurrence? And how you didn't really say whether you know, having a little rim of hyperenhancement counts as that. And so it was turned down by uh, the regions, and now we're sort of back to square one trying to make that more clear and elucidate that because people thought they could get, people could game the system by under-treating a lesion and say, oh, there's residual tumor there in my two-centimeter lesion, three-centimeter lesion. I st my patients still need points. So I guess there's, you know, anyone can game anything. Um, and so that's what, those are some of the things that were pointed out about the policy. Thank <laughs> you.